Right, so now what we're going to do is we are going to put that configuration back on the light board. So what I have is I have the three switches. So I'm no longer focusing on buildings. I'm focusing on the fact that I'm taking switches. And what I'm doing is I'm going to be connecting these switches together into a physical loop. Now the drawback to this is, is the problem, like I said, is, is the fact that when we look at the way we deal with sending traffic, remember we mentioned the fact that we had the flooding behavior. Now, different types of traffic are flooded. We traditionally refer to them as bums in data center. Broadcast traffic, unknown unicast traffic, and multicast traffic will be flooded in layer two switching environments. Now, the problem with this is, is let's operate under the assumption here that I have a host. I have host one, I have host two, and I have host three. Now, the way this is currently configured, each one of these devices is going to ultimately be able to communicate with every other device. But the thing that we need to understand here is, is let's pay attention to the fact that, let's say we put these guys into a network, 172.16.0.0 slash 24, where this is dot one, actually the host will be dot one, dot one, dot two, and dot three. Now, this causes us some significant consternation when we start looking at the behavior of this. So let's say on this host I type ping 172.16.0.3 because I want to ping host 3. Now we've already discussed how this process takes place. So the object here is, is this guy, I know the destination IP, I know the source IP, so I can actually build a layer three packet, but when I hand that down, that layer three packet down to layer two, we've already covered the fact that I need to have the source MAC and I need to have the destination MAC. Well, it stands to reason that I'm going to have the source MAC, that's gonna be whatever the MAC address is assigned to the network card installed in H1, host one. But the problem here is, is that remember, we don't know the destination MAC address, actually we'll go ahead and put that in as a question mark. So we don't know the destination MAC address. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the destination IP 172.16.0.3 and what we're going to do is we're going to send out an ARP request. And hopefully it'll flood throughout my entire infrastructure and get there. Therein lies the problem. Let's take what we've already discussed and use it. So we know that we have three primary behaviors that revolve around basic switching. We said that we have the idea of flooding. And we know broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast are flooded. We know that this ARP request is going out to the all F's address, which we know is a broadcast at layer two. We've already discussed that. Nothing new there. Then what we need to do is we need to look at the idea of forwarding and filtering. Now two mechanisms in this process is, are very, very important. The two that I'm focusing on is going to be the flooding because we know that my ARP messages, so my ARP request is going to be flooded. So I know that my ARP request is going to be flooded. I also know that I have this process where I'm going to filter because I'm using a layer two intelligent device that says do not flood on the interface that I received a frame on. And this is part of what we refer to as a loop prevention tool. It's also just an efficiency mechanism. Because obviously if I received a flood from a destination, i.e. this guy right here, obviously he only leads to his source MAC address because this is what we refer to as an access port. And remember, access ports only work in one VLAN. And normally I would only have 
a host connected to it in this scenario, so it doesn't make any sense for me to flood anything out. So what is going to happen? Let's go ahead and track this. I'm going to use the blue pen. And this is going to get really convoluted really, really quick. So what we'll do is we'll just put a pin in it, and then we'll come back to it, and we'll start talking about it from another perspective. But the main thing here is, is let's operate under the assumption that we send this out. So I send the ARP request out of these two interfaces because of flooding. Now I know that we do not flood back out of the connection. So this is blocked. So it's not going to get flooded out the configuration. I am going to take it and I'm going to replicate it. I'm going to send it out every interface that is a trunk running the VLAN that this particular process takes place in or in any access port that is going to be associated with the VLAN that this process is running in. And in this instance, let's just say it's going to be VLAN 3, just to throw up another number. So what I've just done is I've actually flooded. Now when that flood arrives here on SW1, SW1 is going to look at it and it's not going to be the responsible authority, i.e. it is not H3, therefore it's not going to construct an ARP reply, but because it is flooded, what it's going to do is it's going to flood it out of the interfaces that it has, but just like on SW1 going towards H1, what's going to end up happening is, is I'm not going to flood it out of the interface going to where it came from. You do not flood information on an interface that you learned the flood on. So that is again preventing a loop. So as we go through and we start taking a look at this, that means that this is actually going to arrive down here on switch 3. Obeying the same rules, I'm not going to send it out of the port that I learned it on, but I am going to send it out of this switch. Now when it arrives here, it's actually arriving on this port, which means I'm not going to send it out this direction, but it's important to understand that I will flood it out of both of these interfaces. So by putting this loop in place, this physical loop, what has happened here is, is that I have, now have a process whereby this data is ultimately going to end up being sent round and round and round and round in my infrastructure such that what I have just done is I have created a bridging loop. And this is catastrophic. Because what ends up happening here is, is it's important to understand, and you may remember it from your CCENT studies, and that is, is layer two frames have no TTL. So that means that this replication process not only happens, but it gets compounded every time it gets delivered to another device. And these frames will never die. And what they will do is they will bring your network to its knees. Now fortunately we have a mechanism that's going to allow us to be able to recover from this process, but it is actually a preemptive mechanism that's associated with the way that we used to troubleshoot it. Back in the day when we had one of these bridging loops, what would end up happening is, is that I would go into the data center, I would find the trunks between my switches, I'd pull out a trunk, and then I would wait for all of the flashing lights to go out because that <coughs> actually terminated the loop if I got the right one. If not, I plugged it up and moved to another interface. So what we have is we have a solution that's been put forth that's going to allow us to be able to dynamically prevent these looping processes while simultaneously allowing ourselves to be able to recover if we do need to reconverge on a supported topology. So the idea here is that if I lose this link, the goal is I want the data to go, to, to go the other way, but I want to do it in a way that is not going to introduce a loop in the topology. Now the tool that I'm talking about is spanning tree protocol, 802.1 D spanning tree protocol created by Radia Perlman, postulated, presented as an industry standard solution to be able to stop loops. However, it's been our friend for decades in, uh, in networking, so in regular enterprise networking. But in data center, you're going to learn that it's a, it's a frenemy. It can cause you a lot of problems. It's going to prevent loops, but it comes at a price. So before we talk about the price associated with 
Spanning Tree Protocol as it relates to data center. Let's talk about how Spanning Tree Protocol works, and what we'll do is we'll entertain that in the next video. Till then, I'm Terry Vinson, and I'd like to thank you for loading Data Center with me.